The next affirmative defense we look at is duress. Duress is considered the paradigm excuse as opposed to justification. The idea is not that what the defendant did was a good thing. It is rather that the wrong thing the defendant did was done under the influence of wrongful pressure from another actor. The case of State versus Toscano gives us an example of the elements of the affirmative defense of duress. Toscano was charged with conspiracy to obtain money by false pretenses. The defense did not challenge the prosecution's case in chief. Instead, the defense relied on additional facts that would show why Toscano conspired to commit insurance fraud. Toscano owed money to organized crime. A certain Leonardo proposed that Toscano, a chiropractor, fill out fraudulent medical documents. When Toscano demurred, Leonardo angrily warned that he knew where Toscano lived. Remember, you just moved into a place that has a very dark entrance, and you live there with your wife. You and your wife are going to jump at shadows when you leave that dark entrance. The trial court refused to charge duress. The trial court held that the defendant must allege a threat of instant death or serious bodily harm that is present, imminent, and pending. The trial court held as a matter of law that the evidence Toscano proffered did not show he faced such a threat. In accord is U.S. versus Fleming, a court-martial during the Korean War. The court there insisted that the person claiming the defense of coercion and duress must be a person whose resistance has brought him to the last ditch. However unpleasant the journey to that last ditch may be, however uncertain the actor's fate once that ditch is reached, he must go there, or at least be well on the way, before a defense of duress will be allowed. Why such severity? The court in Fleming as much as confesses that few but the most heroic would have, could have withstood the pressure the defendant's sadistic captors had applied. In the words of the eminent jurist, Sir James Fitzjames Stephen, is it, it is at the moment temptation to crime is the strongest that the law should speak most clearly and emphatically to the contrary. The New Jersey Supreme Court disagreed. It reversed and ordered a new trial, adopting the model penal code definition of the defense of duress. It is an affirmative defense that the actor engaged in the conduct charged because he was coerced to do so by the use of, or a threat to use, unlawful force against his person or the person of another which a person of reasonable firmness in his situation would have been unable to resist. Coercion by use or threat of unlawful force against the person is the gateway. Typically, this is a do it or else threat, but the threat need not be a threat of instant death. It can be a threat of any unlawful force that a person of reasonable firmness would not be able to withstand. Heroism is not required. Notice that the model penal code formulation does not appear to exclude homicide. And the commentary acknowledges that as a feature, not a bug. This has been a bridge too far for courts and legislatures otherwise willing to give the model penal code a hearing. The common law never admitted duress as an excuse for a homicide. It agreed with Aristotle. On some actions, praise is not bestowed, though pardon is, as when an act is done under pressure that no one could withstand. But some acts may be unpardonable, even if the alternative is death by torture. Traditionally, homicide is inexcusable, whatever the threat or unlawful force. The Model Penal Code does place some limits. Some people would do anything to avoid harm to their pets. And the Model Penal Code commentary does say 
concern for the well-being of another can support a defense of duress. So if a little old lady commits a crime because she cannot resist a do-it-or-else threat of harm to her furry companion, has she a model penal code duress defense? Despite the comment, the text tells us no. The threat must be of unlawful force against a person. A dog is not yet recognized as a legal person. Another limitation to the model penal code duress defense comes out in this hypothetical. Suppose the defendant is charged with vandalism for marking the boundaries of the territory his gang controls. Can he raise a defense of duress? The defense provided by this section is unavailable if the actor recklessly placed himself in a situation in which it was probable that he would be subject to duress. Wasn't that Toscano? By running up gambling debts to the mob, wasn't he recklessly putting himself at Leonardo's mercy? Another issue has to do with the person of reasonable firmness standard. How is that defined? Does size matter? Does temperament? The honey badger, shown at left, is small but fearsome. The sheep, depicted at the right, is big but timid. A person might be large and timid or small and fearsome. Is the fact finder to make allowance for the big lamb's timidity or the fearsome honey badger's small size? The model penal code addresses these issues. The standard of the person of reasonable firmness is not wholly external in its reference. Account is taken of the actor's situation. Stark, tangible factors that differentiate the actor from another, like his size, strength, age, or health, would be considered. Matters of temperament would not. So reasonable firmness for a big lamb looks only to the lamb's size and ignores timidity. Likewise for the honey badger, even though the honey badger don't care. 